हेलो हुसैन बोल Is I request the audience members to keep their audio on mute, please. Uh, we'll be live streaming this, so we don't want any disturbances. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible, Saiti. Okay. We start. Uh, so, a very good evening to our uh, respected speaker for today, and all the members of the audience. A warm welcome to you all to Manusmriti, held every year on the Foundation Day of Dr. M. V. L. Khotari, Chair of uh, Medical Humanities, established in the memory of Dr. M. V. L. Khotari, Sir, Pro Professor Emeritus of Saint J. S. Medical College and K. M. Hospital. Dr. Manu Kothari, sir, was a learned scholar, committed academician, most loved teacher by students, a medical philosopher, an author of many books and national and international publications on topics like cancer, death, medical philosophy, etc. Worked for the institution from the day of joining of institution yeah, as yeah. a student till he passed away at the age of 79 on 16th October 2014. He has been highly respected amongst students, teachers, medical fraternity, uh, nationally and internationally. He was a friend, philosopher, and guide for one and all, all category staff in teaching and non-teaching and students. So on passing away of Dr. Manu Kothari, sir, on 16th October 2014, members from medical fraternity felt that we need to have a humanity in medical sciences. They desired to uh, institute a chair of medical philosophy in the name of Dr. Manu Vial Kothari, sir, as a best way to nurture sir's philosophy of life. Therefore, Dr. Manu Vial Kothari, Chair of Medical Humanities, has been instituted at St. G.S. Medical College on 23rd January 2016. Medical Humanities includes the application of various disciplines like history, art, literature, philosophy, etc. in medical education and practice. Under this platform, we will be conducting various events that would take us deep into the human, humane perspective of medicine. 
Now let us watch a short video about Dr. M. V. L. Kothari, sir. मरीज की मुस्कराहटों पे हो निसार मरीज का दर्द मिल सके तो ले उधार मरीज के वास्ते हो तेरे दिल में प्यार डॉक्टर इसी का नाम है वी डॉक्टर्स आर एक्सपेक्टेड टू बी वेल ड्रेस but never too well dressed because it intimidates the patient there is a conversation in new year of medicine where a patient tells the doctor doctor i am afraid of you because you are too well dressed for me so we are supposed to be voluntarily poor maan na doctor dekhne mein fakir hai phir bhi yaar wo dil ke wo ameer hai maan na doctor dekhne mein fakir hai फिर भी यार दिल के वो अमीर है मिटे मरीज के लिए वो जिंदगी करे मरीज के लिए वो बंदगी किसी को हो न हो हमें है तबार डॉक्टर इसी का नाम है अ पेशेंट कम्स टू अस नॉट बाय वॉकिंग not in car not on cycle but on a path of faith yeah. a patient comes faith rishta hai mar iske etbar ka zinda hai tabib se naam pyar ka you know one thing i tell you somebody in distress you look at the person as your own and if love is dripping from your eyes much of the patient's illness is likely to be mitigated we must look at the pain it's i who am suffering it's i it's incidentally in fact in quran it is said that before a doctor goes to a patient he must do thank the god that but for your mathematics i could be there and the patient could be here please remember rishta hai mar iske etbar ka zinda hai tabib se naam pyar ka के मर के भी मरीज को याद आएंगे मरीज की आंसुओं में मुस्कुराएंगे कहेगा हर मरीज मरीज से बार बार डॉक्टर का नाम है so the speaker for today is dr uh, mv uh, the uh, dr mv kirtane currently working as honorable consulting ent surgeon at pd hinduja national hospital bridge candy hospital saifi hospital prince ali khan hospital Uh, Dr M V Kirtane is the professor emeritus of St Jesus Medical College and honorable surgeon at KM Hospital. He has conducted camps for operating on deaf patients free of charge and at the same time training local ENT surgeons to perform microsurgery in various parts of India since 1970. <laughs>
over 1000 patients have been operated as a part of this. this he was awarded by the pa President of India, the prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy Award in the category of recognition of the best talents in encouraging the development of specialities in the different branches of medicine. He was also awarded the Padma Shri by the government of India. He was the president of Association of Auto Laryngologists of India in 1994 to 1995. He is also the Honorable ENT Consultant to His Excellency, Honor of Maharashtra. I now hand, out, hand over to Dr. M. V. Kirtani, sir, to start his audition. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Am I audible clearly? Okay. Yes, sir. I'll just share my screen. So this one, right? <clears throat> it's really a matter of uh, great honor for me to be invited to speak in the memory of Dr. Manubai Kothari. And I thank the president, the executive committee, the office bearers of the Department of Medical Humanities for this privilege. You know, so much has been written and said about Manubhai. So I'm going to limit myself to just some few thoughts that come to my mind when I think of this great man. He's often referred to, as was in the introduction, as uh, a friend, philosopher, and guide. Well, he was a philosopher even before I met him. So uh, that part of him was always there. But as far as... Uh, friend and guide, I would say that he was a guide to me first and later on a friend. And let me explain that. Uh, we joined MBBS in 1965 at GS Medical College. And I think he joined a couple of years earlier as a lecturer or assistant professor. And we were really enthralled by his lectures. We had some great teachers in the Department of Anatomy, but he was a little different because he added life to that lifeless subject of anatomy. He sort of brought it alive. As a matter of fact, he had this thing uh, about the origin of words. You know, he would uh, say that the word anatomy is derived from the Sanskrit word for lifeless, anatmic. And he says, that is how the word anatomy has come to be. He had this sort of snippets and quips for a lot of uh, origin of words. Uh, his first role for me, therefore, was as a teacher who I looked up to. Friends, we became much later when he was the head of department of anatomy and I was on the staff of the ENT department. And I wanted at that time, we had started doing cadaver, uh, not cadaver, I'm talking about endoscopic sinus surgery, very early, we were perhaps the first department in the country to start with endoscopic sinus surgery at KEM. And uh, after we had come, sort of gained some experience, we wanted to start training other surgeons. So I went to him and I said whether we could do workshops with uh, cadaver dissections. And he, of course, was most cooperative. We started doing that once a year. And then we said, can we not put up something here where people can come all year round sort of a laboratory where uh, cadaver dissection would be possible. And uh, he was, of course, all for it. And at that time, he gave me something which is the most precious thing in a city like Mumbai, and that is space, rooms. In the Department of Anatomy, he gave me three rooms. One of them we converted into a nice air-conditioned clinical skills laboratory, which is still there, which was subsequently inaugurated by Professor Heinz Stamberger from Austria, and two rooms where we put up libraries for uh, videos and uh, books. And all this was put together from the money that we generated for the workshops. So people could come any time of the year, register and do dissections. And Dr. Kothari had the foresight. He was not just giving it to me. He realized that this facility would be of help to all surgical specialties in training the young budding surgeons in practicing the art of surgery. After all, 
knowledge of anatomy is the very basis for good surgery. So today that uh, laboratory and the dissection facilities are being used not just by ENT, general surgery, plastic surgery, neurosurgery, etc. Friends, as I said, we became a little later because then I started meeting him more often. Even after I retired from KEM in 2004, I would go and uh, meet him. He would be there in the room with Dr. Lopa Mehta. They would be perusing this volumes uh, on various subjects because he was a prolific reader and writer. And uh, when you chatted with him, you realized that there was still in him uh, a part of his childhood. He was there a slight child in him that never left him because he had that twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face when he would relate an anecdote to you or a, or a snippet. And whenever you discuss something with him, anything, you realize how well informed he was. So for me, he was not just a friend, philosopher, and guide. He was an inspiration by his very nature. If I have to describe this great man in just one word, I would say transparent. There was nothing hidden behind the facade. He was completely transparent. And you know, in English, uh, there is a term that says, walk the talk or put your money where your mouth is. And this is exactly what he did. He had certain beliefs. And if he believed in something, he would stand up boldly for what he believed in, no matter what the opposition. I think here is a message for all of us to take home, that if you truly believe in something, be courageous enough to stand by it, no matter what the others think. You know, in January 2015, we arranged a get together for our 1965 batch. Many of them had gone abroad and there was great enthusiasm. They all wanted to come to their alma mater. And the, the central figure around which the whole program was going to revolve was Dr. Manubhai Kothari. Unfortunately, fate had a different plan. October 2014, uh, he passed away suddenly and we had to forego the pleasure of having him amongst us for our big reunion. But he was always there with us in spirit, will always be there with us in spirit. You know, I, I remember some of his quips which were just uh, mentioned. Saraswati does not like to be bullied by Lakshmi. You just saw that on the screen. And I will refer to this in my presentation in the latter part of the presentation. And the other one, there are some patients whom we cannot help, but there are none whom cannot harm. I think this is a great lesson for us, especially surgeons to take home. You have to know when to operate on a patient, but it's more important. It takes wisdom to know when not to do anything and let nature take its own course. Uh, you know, all of us remember, we just saw this video of Manu Bhai singing, um, his famous version. Maris kemos kara hato peho nisar. Maris tadar damil saket to le udha. And this is something that we as doctors are blessed with. This capacity to relieve the pain and suffering of a patient. To bring back the smile on their face. And the lecture I'm giving today on cochlear implants is about the same thing, because with this uh, gadget, we are able to bring back the smile on the patient's face of children who are born deaf and relieve the pain that the families go through. My talk is in, in two parts today. The first part, I will talk about uh, a cochlear implant and how it works, who it is for procedure, what results can be obtained, miracles, absolutely miraculous results. And the second part would be about our journey into reaching where we have reached today, the difficulties we faced and how we overcame. Okay. Look, 
अब अंग बच्चों को से क्या फायदा वो जिंदगी कुछ नहीं ठीक है जो लोग Imagine having to listen to speech like this broken all your life if you're born deaf or worse still not being able to hear any speech at all you know then you tend to be excluded from the mainstream of life and i want to see or you to see in the next uh, video the expression on the mother's face when a teacher in the kindergarten who's telling stories to a group of children tells the mother to take her child away because the child is deaf and cannot understand the stories being told just watch the mother's face and if this is what the parents feel can you imagine the pain that a child must be feeling when it is shunned by his friends or his peers it leads to existence in a small group of people given to sign language there are certain negative aspects to that in that your opportunity for education is limited limited education therefore limited job opportunities very often a life of dependence not only uh, are they worried but the parents are also worried what will happen of this child once we are no more mm-hmm. Helen is a chap from GS Medical with me you know you are my junior and so nobody the microphone is on can i just request everybody to put their microphones on mute please uh Helen Keller was both deaf and blind but uh, she said she felt that deafness was much worse than blindness when asked by a reporter if she was to be born again and god said that you should have at least one of these two problems she said give me blindness any day because deafness is worse because blindness separates you from things deafness separates you from people and yet today in our society the blind receive sympathy which is quite okay but the deaf often get ridiculed and that's not really fair when parents brought children to us profoundly deaf all that we could tell them was hearing aids give the child a hearing aid and the parents would produce a whole bunch of hearing aids and say we've tried all this and they are not working the deafness is so profound the hearing aid doesn't work and there was nothing we could offer as ent doctors we came to this brick wall just shrugged our shoulders and said okay teach it sign language or lip reading there was nothing we could do till about two and a half to three decades ago this little gadget came out, the cochlear implant and that completely changed the treatment of profound deafness it's not just a sophisticated hearing aid and just for those of you who may not be familiar with cochlear implants i'm just going to tell you what's the difference between a hearing aid sorry i just went off for some time sorry a difference between a hearing aid and a cochlear implant that's a hearing aid a cochlear implant looks very much like a hearing aid aid but it's completely different whenever you have a sound like this you know the sound hits the ear drum the ear drum vibrates and the sound then goes through the ear drum through the auricular chain to the cochlea where the cochlea converts the sound vibrations into an electrical impulse which is taken to the brain by the auditory pathway now if you have a cochlea that's partially damaged then what's happening is that the sound waves are coming there hitting the eardrum going to the cochlea but the amount of electric current generated is so small that the patient can't hear you need to increase that production and therefore what do you do you give the patient a hearing aid which is nothing but an amplifier so the sound waves come into the hearing aid they are amplified made loud so the sound energy quantum that's going to the eardrum and to the patient's inner ear is increased by the hearing aid but you are still stimulating the patient's cochlea and the cochlear hair cells of the patient and you are able to generate electrical signals 
that the patient can hear. But imagine, but imagine. you can have this impression of the cochlea functioning. These are the hair cells and the fluid movement produces bending of these hair cells here. And that is what leads to production of the electrical signal in the cochlea. Imagine a cochlea where these hair cells are completely gone, dead. There are no hair cells left. So you can give the loudest sound to the cochlea and there is no electric signal being generated. So hearing aids now are useless. What you need to do for this patient is to allow electrical signals once again to stimulate the cochlear nerve, the spiral ganglion there in the cochlear nerve. And this is what a cochlear implant does. It basically consists of two parts. There is an external component, which looks like a hearing aid, but it is not a hearing aid. This is how the patient wears it. There's a microphone that picks up the sound, doesn't feed it to the ear, but feeds it to this computer here. This computer then converts the sound energy into electrical signals, just like the cochlea would have done inside the body. Then using this gadget here, which is a transmitting coil put on the scalp and the implant, which is the internal part is surgically put under the skin so that this antenna exactly matches the coil over here. And this array of electrodes is put into the cochlea and you need multiple electrodes to stimulate different sort of levels of the cochlea because you know that the cochlea is like a rolled up piano and the different levels of the cochlea are sensitive to different frequencies. So you want the patient to know which different frequencies are coming. So you have multiple electrodes. So the sound goes to the processor, electrical signal generated, the transmitter coil passes it on to the implanted array, which takes the sound, uh, the electrical signals to the cochlea and differentially stimulates the different levels of the cochlea, depending on what is the incoming frequency. So I don't have to explain that again. Array, uh, sorry, the processor picks up the sound, converts to electric signals, transmitter coil, sends it to the implant, which sends it to the uh, array of electrodes, which stimulate the cochlear nerve, and now the patient, once again, has sound going to the auditory cortex. Now, who do we use it for? It's, as I said, it's not a sophisticated hearing aid. Therefore, you have to have patients who merit a cochlear implant. So they are patients with bilateral profound or severe to profound deafness, where you use a hearing aid to see if they benefit. And if you can show that they have little or no benefit from the hearing aid, then they become candidates provided there are no medical contraindications for surgery and no radiographical contraindications. By this, I mean there are patients without cochlea. I mean, agenesis of the cochlea, there's no cochlear nerve, then they would not be candidates. And of course, they need to have support. They should be motivated, appropriate expectations. They should have a clinic that will take care and they should have supportive services. And what are the supportive services? When you put that implant in and when you switch it on, the patient will hear a sound, but there is no area in the brain cortex reserved for a computer to feed sound. So a certain amount of training is required. Two to three years of training by what is called auditory verbal therapists for the person to really learn language and learn how to speak. So it's not just the surgery, but a major part is the auditory verbal therapy for two to three years that follows. So you have two groups of patients, the post-lingual, these are patients who are born normal, who develop language and speech, and who at some point in their life became deaf, say because of trauma, because of virus infection, or because of autotoxic drugs. And the other group is the pre-lingual, or the children who are born deaf or who became deaf very early in life, before they learned language and developed speech. But both these groups, as I said, would be subjected to a hearing aid trial. And only if we know that the hearing aid is not helping them, that will go for the cochlear implant. 
So, in the post-lingual group, if the person is fit, age is not a criteria. They can be, we've operated on patients beyond the age of 80 and they've done very well. Because their auditory cortex, their speech and language is already developed. But in children who are born deaf, who are prelingually deaf, okay. it's a race against time. Because at birth, the auditory cortex is blank. And as the cortex receives sound, you know, a one-day-old baby can hear everything but can't understand, can't speak. Repeatedly, the sound going to the auditory cortex, a lot of synapses open up over there to connect the various areas so that the words that are going in are given meaning. And after some time, the synapses connect that to the Broca's area for speech so that when a child who has learned a word wants to pronounce it, there has to be a connectivity for him to know how to pronounce that word. And that happens in the auditory cortex with the synapses opening up due to stimulation of sound. Now, if no sound is given to the auditory cortex because the child is deaf, you have a neighboring visual cortex which is functioning well. It sees this blank area and it just grows and takes over the auditory cortex. So if you now restore sound in this child at the age of 10 or 12 years of life, the sound will still be converted to electrical signals, but there is hardly any cortex left for the child to make use of to understand. And that's why restoring the child's capability of hearing is a race against time. This is to show you diagrammatically that the synapses that open up in the brain are maximum in the first two years of life. If by this time there is no stimulation going in, the capacity to develop these synapses becomes less and less and ultimately will lose the capacity to develop the synapses. So the message is very clear. The auditory system, whether it's the periphery or the central system, has to be used very early in life for speech and language to develop. The message is either you use it or you lose it. And that's why the race against time. So ideally, if we have to do a cochlear implant in a profoundly deaf child, we should do it before the age of three, preferably before the age of two years. Up to six years, we still can feel that there should be a good response. But after that, it's very, very variable as to how the child, because you have no way of knowing how much of the auditory cortex is still available to that child for learning language and developing speech. And that brings us to our responsibility of doctors to make an early diagnosis. Madam Uli. Sorry. Madam Uli, you know, every time the misguidance started from the beginning, even if we, we, we showed to a pediatrician, they said, the pediatrician is saying that when he was a five years old, he started speaking. He is okay, she can speak, do this, everything, no problem for her. So he said, no problem. When we showed her in a good hospital in Bahrain, the doctor said she is having the wax. They removed the wax. They said everything is okay. I said if everything is okay, then when I speak, why she is not able to tell me anything? So we are talking about children and uh, adults whose deafness is that down, you know, in the decibel level, completely deaf. This is what we started with. And uh, we were told that you can only operate on these people when they get no benefit.
from a hearing aid. But today things are different with the experience that we've gathered over the last two and a half decades. We're even operating on people who have an audiogram where they are able to hear things, as you can see this blue line here. They're having fairly good low frequency sounds, but the high frequencies are down. And we are operating on them. And there is a reason because with hearing aids, yes, they are getting some benefit, but they are not getting benefit in the higher frequency areas, 2000, 4000, 8000. And that gives them a handicap because they can hear sound, but they cannot understand what are the spoken words. For example, here you have a patient where the red line shows you what the hearing is like. With a hearing aid, the black line shows you how there is improvement, great improvement, but the high frequencies are still limited, are sort of limitedly below what ideal uh, improvement should be. So this patient with a hearing aid will hear definite louder speech, but because the high frequencies are required for discrimination, uh, will not do well. While if we do a cochlear implant, we can then bring them to this level where the speech will be clearly heard. So basically you have to understand that the low frequencies, which are mainly the vowels, give you the power, the sound comes to, but the high frequencies, which are the consonant, the sir, 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 they give us the intelligibility. So to give you an example, to give a sort of visual analog, if I were to give you a nursery rhyme, which all of you know, and I've removed all the consonants which are required for intelligibility, I give you only the vowels. Can you guess which nursery rhyme it is? I mean, I know you can rack your brains, but if I give you the consonants, it becomes very obvious. As against this, I give you another nursery rhyme where I take away the vowels, but I give you the consonants and you don't have any difficulty. So you understand the importance of getting the high frequencies. I'm going to try and show you how this works. Let's, for example, take this person with this kind of an audiogram where the 250 is very good, right? So let's try and blank out the others and a sentence which is being spoken by a person, try and see what it is heard like by a person who has only 250 hertz. 250 hertz, low pan. This is all that that person is hearing. Let's go to 500 hertz. And now you've given him the capacity to hear these, but the other frequencies he is not able to hear, the higher frequencies. And this is what he. Next, has. 500 hertz, low pass. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, wide arch with its two high above and its two ends beyond the horizon. When a man looks for something beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pan of gold at the end of the rainbow. And as you go to more frequencies, he's getting a little better, but even then... 1000 hertz, low pass. Not happy. Rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. We take the shape of a long round arch. So a person high with above, high, high frequency, frequency loss, even right. with the hearing aid, may only and get speech like this. Beyond his reach, his friend says he's looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But if you were to restore all his high frequencies, as you can the rainbow the is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arch with its path high above and its two ends beyond the horizon. When a man looks for something beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is a cochlear implant. Of course, you need to do radiology to make sure that you have a good enough cochlea to put the implant in, that the cochlear nerves are present. Sometimes in almost 20 to 25% of our patients, we find deformed cochlea, but we can still operate, except when you come to situations where it's an agenesis of the cochlea, a hypoplastic cochlea where you cannot operate, or if the cochlear nerve is not formed. So radiology forms are important. Audiological evaluation, radiology. The surgery is not rocket science. Anybody who knows how to do a good mastoid can do a cochlear implant with a little additional training. And I'm running through this, not to teach you the surgical steps, but tell you how simple it can be provided you're properly trained. 
It's like a temporoplasty incision just behind the ear. That's all it takes. This is to mark out where you are going to position that processor. Raise a periosteal flap. See that the pocket is deep enough. We put a dummy inside to see that the dummy fits in properly. Do a, a mastoidectomy to expose the inner ear. A bit of carpentry work to fit that implant inside. So you drill and make sure that the implant is going to fit in there. You want to tie it down. Uh, you can drill sort of holes by the side, drill a channel. And now you take the implant, costing about six lakhs, put the implant in, tie it down, and these arrays will be put into the mastoid. That's a ground electrode, periosteal flap, end of story. By evening, the patient can go home. And what we are doing inside the uh, inner ear, I'll just show you. Uh, this is the mastoidectomy, the posterior tympanotomy through which we expose the round window. That's the round window here of the cochlea. And this is how we put the implant inside. That implant is a special implant called the contour. It's got a stillet there. It's about 0 0.8 milli uh, millimeters in, in, in diameter. And now what we do is we go up to that white mark. As I said, there is a stillet inside this. And now I'm going to take the implant off the stillet, like you remove your sock from your foot. And this will show you what is happening inside the patient's cochlea. Ah, codec unavailable. This is not playing. Why is the codec unavailable? This is how the implant sort of goes in into the cochlea, as you saw here. Watch it here. Now, after we do that, we check always with a C arm or an X-ray that the implant is properly put. We check electrically testing that the implant is functioning on the operation table. This is what you call a neural response telemetry. So we know that the implant is in correct position by the X-ray and the implant is functioning. And once the wound is healed, the patient undergoes what's called mapping, that's tuning the implant to decide what level of sound will generate what current in the patient's ear. For each of the 22 electrodes, this is done manually by the audiologist. And then comes a therapy session. Now the child is just getting the sound and it takes two to three years. Even a child born normally, takes two to three years to learn to speak a language and sentences. So these children will take about two to three years of extensive auditory verbal therapy to be able to use the implant. And this has to be impressed on the minds of patients before they go for a cochlear implant. It takes not just planting the seed, which is putting the implant inside, but nurturing it that will allow you to see that beautiful outcome. Now, this young girl, Kuhu, is one year old, she's got a deformed cochlea, couldn't hear anything at all. Even if you burst a bomb next to her, she would not be moved. Very cute girl. I operated on her when she was one year old. Two years later, she's taking part in a drama. And these are all operated girls. Who, who is here? For dinner. We don't know. Here they come, is what she says. Here they come. Very basic relaxation. And now, for dinner. this is Kuhun, which has recorded about three years ago. Hi, my name is Kuhun. Uh, I was operated on when I was one year old, and uh, I have a cochlear implant. And uh, I am not. What do you want to be when you grow up? I'm speaking I want to, to be a very a softly. Uh, when I grow up. Writer for the movies or novels? Or uh, books, actually. Who's your favorite author? My favorite author is Jackie. She's following Rowling. my questions beautifully without listening. <laughs> Harry. Harry. <laughs> Harry Potter. So do you want to write children's novels? Yeah. Any other children's authors you've read? Um... 
This is Shanice. She was operated at a little later age, about three and a half to four when she was operated. This is just a year and a half after surgery, or two years, I think, after surgery. And uh, yeah. why is this happening? I think I've, I've, just give me a minute, it will come back, don't worry. Having a little problem with the computer. Come on, guys. Your battery is connected. Okay, so let's go back. Where are we going? To Kaelin Towns. Yeah, we're going to Kaelin Towns. What are we going to do in Kaelin Towns? The searchers are not coming very clearly. We are going to check if the pant is fitting me. And if the pant is not fitting you, then you can't wear a pant for the part. Then what will you wear? It matters to... I wear my dress. Janice, will you say that poem forgotten for us? I became my dance class today. Dance now dance it's dance time dance. for home. Everybody else is gone, but I am here alone. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting by the gate. You also have to see what it means to the parents. We're having the same problem again. December 6th would be exactly two years to the uh, switch on of her implant. I will only say that Chanice has improved by leaps and bounds. Her speech, her speech is close to normal oh right God. now. Chanice, two minutes, okay? I can go out. Uh, she Mama, goes go to out. a regular yeah, normal. Go I don't have to go to be the liaison anymore. Shanice has started watching a lot of uh, programs on TV, which initially was only cartoons because that was the only place where she didn't have to hear voices. Most importantly, her self-confidence and her hearing is as a parent, as um, I mean, I can see that vision of mine as to her being an independent person, you know, just, just, just there now. I don't have any. So now you know what I mean by bringing the smile back to the faces, not only of the child, but of the family as well. Chinese has made good progress. This is a few years ago. I am Chinese Fernandez. I'm at the cochlear implant for 14 years now. Uh, I just passed out from 12th grade uh, I, from DPS uh, and uh, I scored 94.6% and I was a topper of my school. Currently I'm doing BBA. I have a lot of hobbies. Uh, one of them is listening to music, dancing. I love reading novels. Recently, maybe two years or something, I have got into the habit of cooking and baking. Childhood restaurant. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shanice Fernandez and I'm your first anchor this morning, afternoon. On behalf of Cochlear India, I welcome you all to this press conference on the importance of hearing and hearing screening. Let me welcome our first guest, cricket legend, Brett Lee, um, who need, definitely needs no introduction in India. He's Cochlear's first global hearing ambassador and has agreed to take up this role today's awareness about the significance of impact hearing on individuals and their family. I, I am privileged to invite our second guest, Padma Shri Awardee, Dr. Milan Kritane, and also my implanting surgeon. Dr. Kritane is a senior consultant ENT surgeon at Hinduja Hospital. Is Professor Emeritus at Seth Chi and Medical College and KEM Hospital. Dr. Kitane is regarded as one of the pioneers of cochlear implants in India.
And uh, Sanskrit is not an easy language to learn. I also want you to see the joy on the face of the parents and the involvement. The father is repeating the whole thing that the son is saying. Is reciting. My name is Adit Bhavani. I am going to be a acting teacher. I am going to be a teacher. I am going to be a teacher. I am going to be a teacher. I am Kanana Kundana Kunchita Kesa Adara Jadwa Jabiraje Kande Mujane Usaje. That smile on the mother's face, amazing. I'm going to talk about our journey in cochlear implants in Mumbai and in India, the obstacles we faced and how we overcame them. I first saw a cochlear implant being performed in 1979 in the city of Duren, very close to Köln. And uh, the implant being used was what's called the hedgehog. It was a seven electrode extra cochlear implant, as you see in this picture, about the size of a fingernail. It's a flat implant with seven electrodes sticking out and a neutral electrode. The surgeon made seven small pits on the promontory and then was struggling to put this flat implant on a convex promontory. You know, it looked something like this. It looked like something like this to me. And I said to myself, I am never going to be doing cochlear implants. In 1995, I had the occasion to go to Melbourne and meet Professor Graham Clark. And after meeting him and listening to him, my perspective of cochlear implants changed completely. I also had a chat with Rod Saunders, one of his first patients. And he was the one who really convinced me how wonderfully well the cochlear implant was working. I came back to Mumbai and wanted to start the cochlear implant program at this hospital, that is the PD Hinduja National Hospital and Medical Research Center. In 1996, Professor Bill Gibson from Australia came down and operated one patient that was the only surgery I saw before I started doing cochlear implants myself. That is our first patient, which Professor Gibson had operated 25 years ago. We like to keep in touch with as many of our patients as possible. And this gentleman now is married, has two children and a wonderful job. But in 1996, we operated that one case. We could operate just one more case in 1997, and there's two cases in 1998. India is a populous country, very thickly populated, and Mumbai has been a medical center where people from all over India flock for medical treatment. Then why could we not find patients for cochlear implants. It's because we came up against this brick wall with many obstacles, and I will deal with each one of them in turn. First of all, the cochlear company allowed us to operate only on adults as our first few cases, and that to adults with complete deafness or what we call total deafness where the hearing aid had no benefit at all. They said you cannot operate on children unless you have done a few adults. 
at the Hinduja Hospital, when I started with the program, I was the surgeon and I was quite confident I would be able to do the implant. We had good audiologists, good imaging, mapping facilities, but we had no therapy center. A few years before we started our cochlear implant program, some surgeries had been done in Mumbai using a single electrocochlear implant. Nothing wrong with the surgery, but being a single electrode implant, the outcomes were very limited. And many of the patients were not very satisfied with these outcomes. So when we advise a cochlear implant to a patient, he would go around trying to find other patients who had the implant. And he would encounter one of these patients who had got a single electrode implant who were unhappy and who would very vehemently tell our patient not to do the implant. We also had to face angry teachers of the deaf from various deaf schools and centers in Mumbai who would tell us, do not touch our patients. It took me some time to put together a team of like-minded progressive audiologists and teachers of the deaf. And with this core team, we started getting more and more patients and doing more and more surgery. These audiologists and teachers of the deaf working at different centers in Mumbai were spread out, but they would refer their patients to Hinduja after working up the audiological profile and ensuring that the child needed a cochlear implant. We would examine the child, go through the investigations and confirm that the child indeed was a candidate for cochlear implants, do the surgery, and then send the patients back to the respective centers for mapping and auditory verbal therapy, a sort of hub and spoke model that we started right from the beginning. The other major difficulty I had was, although I was confident of doing mastoid surgery and I had done mastoids by the thousands, putting in an implant was something new and I had no guide or no mentor to look over my shoulder or to support me when I started doing these surgeries after having seen just one close at hand with Professor Gibson. So I had to have somebody standing in the operation theater with an operation instruction manual to guide me through the steps. When I had a surgery planned on a particular day, the previous evening after finishing my practice, which would be around say nine o'clock in the evening, I would sit and dissect a temple bone to a posterior tympanotomy and put in a dummy implant, fix it in place. The next morning I would put it in a lunch box and take it to my hospital because the hospital won't want me to bring in cadaver material, so I had to camouflage it in the lungs box. Take it to my friend in the radiology department, ask him to do an x-ray and check that I had really put the implant in the correct place. There were occasions when I found myself in difficulty during surgery. And as I said, I had nobody to guide me or mentor me. So what could I do? I've picked up the phone at these times and dialed my friends in Australia, Professor Robert Briggs, Professor Brian Pyman, and sometimes even my friend in Chennai, Mohan Kameshwaran, and asked them for help. And they have been obliging and have guided me through these difficult situations. After all, the interest of the patient is of prime importance and you have to do everything possible to make sure that you complete your surgery properly.
it was towards the end of 1998 that we started doing pediatric cochlear implants. That's our first patient operated in 1998. And the picture next to it shows you the same patient in 2021 at the time of her marriage. As I said, we like to keep in touch with almost all our patients as far as possible. Incidentally, this girl also represents India at the Deaf Olympics in badminton. Once we started doing the pediatric implants, the number of patients coming in started increasing significantly, but then we faced another problem, and that is the cost of the implant. It became a major issue because many of the patients, as a matter of fact, almost nine out of 10 patients that came to us could not afford to do the implant. The cost of the implant and surgery was about seven times higher than the poor man's annual income. We had to turn to some of our rich patients and corporates to help out. That is a picture of a donation that we got from Mahindra and Mahindra a company that manufactures automobiles and tractors and heavy machinery. And it was given to us at the hands of the then president, the late Dr. APJ Kalam. We also got some donations from government. Uh, for example, that is the chief minister of Rajasthan donating an implant to a patient. And then we formed this nonprofit organization called the I Hear Foundation, where we collect donations from corporates and some rich patients, and then use the money to fund implants for the economically weaker section of society. So with the pediatric patients coming in, and receiving donations, because most of the donors gave donations only to the pediatric patients. And with the hub and spoke model, where we got patients from different parts of the city, the program started growing. Hello. And the hub and spoke okay. extended well beyond the boundaries of Mumbai to the state of Maharashtra, and then to various centers all over India. So we started now getting pediatric patients from different parts of India coming into Mumbai because funding was available to them, getting their surgery done and then going back to their respective places for mapping and auditory verbal therapy. And that's how the graph grew. And today we stand at close to 3,500 surgeries being done. To ensure that the patients who went to far off places after surgery received adequate mapping and therapy, we started conducting annual workshops where all the audiologists and therapists would be called to one place and they would get lectures, discussions and uh, difficult cases would be discussed so that everybody was more or less on the same page. We did not do this in Mumbai because, as our experience showed, people coming from outside to Mumbai by afternoon would run off to see Bollywood studios or for shopping or visiting friends. So we would take them to a resort somewhere where there was no escape. So everybody attended the scientific program from morning to evening. But then these audiologists and AVT specialists pointed out to us that it was getting more and more difficult for their patients to travel from different parts to Mumbai. Also, more companies had to come into the market and they were no longer very strict about whom they offer cochlear implants to. There were a lot of young surgeons all over India who wanted to get onto the bandwagon of cochlear implants. And they needed to be trained properly because 
as is obvious, certification by university does not imply competence in the operation theater for doing a particular surgical procedure, which they may not have been exposed to earlier. And of course, we did encounter some surgeons with an attitude that says, well, I've got my master of surgery degree. Nobody can stop me from doing an operation that I want to do. So we started training surgeons coming from these different parts, referred by their audiologists. And over a period of time, we've established these centers in different parts of India. It is to be realized that there is no control by a medical board or society, at least in India, on who can be a cochlear implant surgeon. We have a cochlear implant group of India, which has worked very hard to give guidelines to people, and these are available on the website, but it doesn't have the teeth to enforce these to any new cochlear implant surgeon. So for the past 13 years, we've been conducting training workshops with young surgeons to come and see surgery, do hands-on casual dissection, have lectures. And I also have fellowships where young surgeons from different parts of India come and stay with me for six months, go through their training, get some hands-on experience. And it is my commitment to them that when they go back to their place, wherever they came from in India, when they do their first few cases, I will travel down to their place and stand by with them to guide them through their first few surgeries till I feel confident that they can do it by themselves. We now have difficulties in procuring uh, cadaver temporal bones for certain regulations. So we are now using the 3D printed temporal bones and they work very well for training. These are some of the surgeons from all over India that I have trained and mentored. And these are some of the more recent fellows who are now practicing cochlear implants at their own places. And these are 21 surgeons from Mumbai, that's my city. And I think now the number is almost at 27. And these are doctors that I have trained and mentored stood by them so that they could do their cochlear implants properly. Now, these are from my city of Mumbai. And rather than consider them as competitors, I look at them as a team of doctors that help us deal with the large population that comes to Mumbai for surgery. But mentoring is not, it's really a tough job that takes up a lot of time especially when I have to travel to far off places weekend after weekend. And I have to be sure that the facilities at these places where I'm going to be operating and mentoring people are adequate. Some of the places that I went to, I was quite horrified to see the conditions. I then had to be a little strict and ensure that in order to continue the program, they would get the necessary facilities in place. I always insist on a post-operative imaging before extubating the patient at one of the centers. This is how they were doing it without any protection to the person who was shooting the x-ray. So all that had to be put in order. So for mentoring, you had not only to spend your time and effort, but also to check and ensure proper facilities. You had to make a number of visits which took toll on your schedule. Time management became difficult. And of course, you could land up in difficult situations when the mentee was operating. So you had to be able to predict problems and solve them. You have to wait in the theater till the job is completely done. You cannot look at the clock. In a lighter vein, let me show you the trials and tribulations of a mentor. No matter what a difficult situation he may be in, he has to support the mentee till such time.
that the job is well done and the patient is taken care of. It doesn't matter how difficult it is for you. You cannot board your flight until you get it right. Otherwise, you can land up. And the insistence on post-operative imaging before extubation is to avoid situations of misplaced areas. Till date, we've set up several such centers all over India and sometimes many centers in the same city itself. Let me give you an example. Let's take city of Nagpur in the central part of India. I coordinate with the surgeons in five or six different hospitals in Nagpur and request them to plan their cases on a particular weekend that I'm traveling there. I stay in the operation theater of a centrally located hospital with a mobile phone and a car available to me to dash off to any of the centers that may require me, which I can reach in 10 minutes. Usually five to seven patients would be operated at each of these centers during the day. And these would be supervised by my own team of doctors who work with me in Mumbai and are expert enough now to guide the others. And if they require any help, I can dash off there and be there with them, as I said, within 10 minutes. So on a given day, we managed to do about 25 <laughs> to 28 cases. So now the number of cases that I have operated or mentored has grown to about, but only... Sorry. So now the number of cases that I have operated or mentored has grown to about 3,341. But only 7 to 8% of these are adults because funding is available only for children and hence the large proportion of pediatric cochlear implants in our series. Several state governments and even the central government has now started funding cochlear implants. And the number of centers set up over the country has grown close to 250 now. And the number of surgeries done through these programs has gone well over 10,000. It's certainly great for a poor patient to be able to get a free cochlear implant. But people tend to forget that after the implant, there is a certain amount of post-operative maintenance cost, almost lifelong. And many of these poor patients cannot cope up with that. And other facilities like diagnostic centers, availability of hearing aids, audiological services and auditory verbal therapy centers have not kept pace with the sudden increase in the surgical centers and the number of surgeons doing cochlear implants. So this and the post-operative maintenance cost with a lot of patients not being able to keep up with it has resulted in a high dropout rate. And this is indeed very sad. Of course, we hope that the price would come down one day and the implant would be easily available to most people when the dream of this man, our past president, late Dr. APJ Kalam, comes true and an Indian implant is available. It feels good when you get recognition for all your efforts, awards, rewards, are welcome and an incentive to work harder. But the best reward is the smile on the patient's face and the knowledge and satisfaction that you have 
touched somebody's life and made it better. You know, there was a patient who walked into my clinic, an old man with his grandson, brought to me by an audiologist. My clinic was packed. They had no appointment. But because I saw the card coming in from an audiologist who worked with me, I immediately took them out of turn. And this old man asked me a lot of very intelligent questions about cochlear implant that he wanted to do for his grandchild. Took up almost half an hour with a waiting room outside completely packed. At the end of the consultation, uh, he asked me for my charges. And looking at him, knowing that it would be a burden on him, I said, no, it's okay. And we run a free OPD for cochlear implants at the Hindu Hospital in any case. So for the past many years, we've been doing that. So I said, no charges. And uh, he was sort of insisting on paying. I stuck to my guns and I said, no, you don't have to pay. So the audiologist took the child and went yeah. down. As the, old man was, as the old man was leaving the room, he just stopped at the door, turned around to me and he said, Dr. Sahib, I don't want to say anything bad to you. And I said to myself, well, so many patients say so many things to us. You know, we've developed a thick skin. We don't feel bad. You say anything bad to me. He said, you have seen a picture of your face. He said, yes, see. He said, I want to say a dialogue to you. You are all good people. So you don't need to take money. But if you take money from the ground, what will you eat? meaning that I should be charging him. And I asked him, Bhai sahab, when you came, what was the place outside? He said, you were waiting for the waiting room, you were standing there, you didn't have any place to stay. And I told him, that's my place. Cochlear implants is something that God has given us, doctors, ENT surgeons especially, to pay back to the society for all the good things that we get as doctors. We can make money from your mastorectomies and stapedectomies and tonsillectomies, but cochlear implants, nine out of your 10 patients are poor. And that is where it's payback time for all the good things we get. There's a lot of research going on in deafness and the future holds many prospects. Genetic engineering. And stem cells may one day offer cure for deafness. And cochlear implant surgeons may no longer be necessary. And when this has decided on an alternative career. You know, you're talking about Maris Kemus Kara Hato Peho Nisar. Manu Bhai could spontaneously break into song to drive home a point. I, for one, cannot sing to save my life. But for a friend like Manu Bhai, दुनिया Thank you very much for a patient listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for, for a, such a heart-touching and inspiring oration about cochlear implants and your journey as a pioneer surgeon performing these surgeries in India. Now we have the vote of thanks by Dr. Padmaja Sahamun. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this 
compelling lecture on your journey with cochlear implants. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, Samita and uh, 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 Rohan for giving me this opportunity to offer the vote of thanks. My salutations to Dr. Uh, uh, Manubhai Kothari on this uh, very important day of Manusmriti. Um, listening to okay, a very important message for teachers as well as students on how to pursue their dreams and how to find out, analyze what is going wrong and finding solutions with uh, single-minded perseverance. So important, sir. I think you have charged so many minds today. And uh, message to teachers about mentoring the students very, very important message, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I thank Dr. Um, Deshmukh, sir, and Dr. Narkar for uh, uh, always encouraging uh, Division of Medical Humanities to conduct their programs. I thank Dr. Pandya, sir, and Dr. Lupa Mehta, madam. Uh, without oh, their vision, these programs wouldn't have been possible. Uh, uh, kudos to the student team of uh, Samhita, uh, Rohan, Darsh, Mrinmai, and many others. I don't uh, recall all the names together, but for conduction of this ascension and the program that they conduct the year through. And uh, uh, last but not the least, uh, most importantly, all the participants to uh, having made these programs possible and uh, successful. Thank you all so much. Um, thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. On the behalf of Dr. Emil Kothari, Chair of Medical Humanities, we would like to present this plaque to Dr. Kirtane, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, uh, we have come to the end of this session and now we have with us the results of the online competitions held as part of the pre-ascension events. First uh, uh, competition is blog writing competition, which was judged by Dr. Rashmi Patil Ma'am from Anatomy Department. First prize goes to Darshita uh, Jagatia from First MBBS, St. G.S. Medical College, she wrote on the topic philosophy and coronavirus and how the pandemic changed me. Second prize goes to Apoor Bansal from final year, St. G.S. Medical College. He wrote on the topic of a loss of a loved one to one, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The second competition is symphony and the winner is uh, Manali Jagdab from second MBBS, St. G.S. Medical College. She gave her entry on the topic music that comes. Third competition was a uh, painting competition, which was judged by Dr. Munida Halpirkani Nam from Physiology Department. So the first prize goes to uh, Sonia Gavi, third year uh, Ayurveda, Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya Sayan. And she wrote on the topic 600 days and still counting. Second prize goes to Shikha Soni uh, uh, from third minor MBBS, St. G.S. Medical College. Then the third prize goes to Sonia Gavli from third year uh, Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya Science. So I want to thank our Dean Sir, Dr. Padmaja Ma'am, Dr. Sunil Pandya Sir, Dr. Lopa Ma'am, Dr. Ravi Ramakantan Sir, the judges of the competitions, Dr. Uh, Rashmi Patil Ma'am, Dr. Munira Ma'am, and all the core, mem core members. So lastly, a big thank you to the audience for their patient listening. And on this note, we end the session here. Have a good night. <laughs>